Hello YouTube! This is a video covering some of my thoughts about who should rule in the Fallout series. And by that, I mean, as, as you probably know, the Fallout series is set in a post-apocalyptic America. It's set a few hundred years after the event. There's a little bit of oddity with the actual time period it's set in because really the world should probably be both a lot more beat up and recovered. Um, by the time most of the games are set. By which I mean the city should not have nearly as much of their civilized stuff standing, but nature should have recovered a lot more by the time of the series. There's a few ways to interpret this. Maybe the laws of physics are a little bit different. We know that radiation probably works pretty differently in the Fallout universe than it does in the real universe. And I know that we could write off a lot of that as the purpose of all of that is to tell a story, not to simulate a reality. But I'm going to take things a little bit more seriously anyhow. And so we're, we're talking about who should rule. And what I mean is, of the factions we'll be talking about today, which of them would be most ideal and or successful in ruling uh, what used to be the United States. And there's a lot of ways to evaluate that, but first let's uh, talk about what we're uh, covering. I have, I started playing Fallout with Fallout 3 and I thought Fallout 3 was a great game. Fallout New Vegas uh, is probably the best game in the series in my view. Fallout 4 is pretty good. Uh, actually, in some ways it's better, in some ways it's not nearly as good as its two predecessors. Um, I have not played Fallout 1 and 2 because I don't tend to like games with that kind of uh, overview. Just the, the interface, it's not my cup of tea. Uh, I, I like the first-person experience of the Fallout games. Uh, I consider Fallout 76 to be non-canon, and so uh, it will be considered non-canon for purposes of what we're covering. And the reasons for that, largely, uh, A, I think it's, it's bad, and B, they, um, Bethesda unfortunately kind of has a thing for the Brotherhood of Steel, uh, they see them as emblematic of the series, and so they bent the, uh, the canon of the game to shove uh, the Brotherhood of Steel into a time and place where they really shouldn't be. And so I consider that canon breaking, and so I consider it to invalidate the canon of Fallout 76. I have not played the two um, other, uh, the Fallout... Uh, Brotherhood and Fallout Brotherhood of Steel. What are those two games called? I don't remember. There have been a few spin-off spin games. Uh, there's a really cute little game uh, that's a vault management sim. Uh, I don't remember what it's called. I have no opinion on its uh, canonicity. It doesn't really contribute a lot to lore. It's just a cute little management game. But we're going to uh, focus primarily on the factions that are seen in Fallout 3, uh, Fallout New Vegas, and Fallout 4. And I I do consider Fallout 1 and 2 to be canon, but I because I haven't played them, I might be missing some of what they cover. So, uh, so now that we've established what games we uh, we consider uh, relevant for this, uh, let's talk a little bit about how to how we're evaluating things. And a lot of other videos I've found don't really go into this enough, and I think really the methodology or even the definitions are the most important thing. So one of the observations that we can make is that longevity is important for a faction. Uh, and longevity of a government means is there a way to pass power, uh, pass along power between the leaders, between generations? Everyone eventually dies, and so any faction that depends entirely on one person will eventually fail, 
unless it can find a way to plausibly pass it to a new person. Leadership is a, uh, is a process across generations. So that's important. There are a few factions that we'll talk about that are overly dependent on, uh, on one person. And it's hard to imagine how they would do, uh, how they would actually pass power along. So I, I, I want to ding them for that. Whereas factions that are, that have a political system or some other way of deciding who rules, uh, they will, I'll, I'll consider that a good thing. Next, we'll, uh, we have to think about what kind of a future does it point at? What are their values? What economic and other policies do they have that will sustain them? Stuff like that. Next, we have to talk about their ambitions. Do they actually want to rule uh, the um, rule the former United States uh, or not? Would they actually bother to expand? Could they? And we might be willing to fudge this a bit. Factions change. Uh, maybe a, a faction that isn't particularly ambitious now might become so. But a really small faction that doesn't seem interested in expanding or even controlling territory, that's not going to be one that's going to do particularly well, uh, at least in, in terms of what we're, uh, how we're measuring this. We next have to ask, what kind of relations do they have with their neighbors? Are they friendly? Are they hostile? Uh, how do they um, how do they work in terms of uh, diplomacy? Uh, we think about how they handle disputes. Uh, what kind of laws do they have? Do they have laws? Uh, and what kind of cultural and scientific strengths do they have? Do they develop new technologies? Do they do research? Do they educate their people or not? These are all really important things for society. And uh, in the real world, a lot of this stuff developed over time. And countries that were bad at too many of these things didn't do well. And for a few factions, uh, we might consider the role that the player leading it uh, has on it, or how much its status quo has changed historically. Maybe think about imaginable changes from a period of player leadership. It'll be a minor factor. Um, and I, I will this is not an exhaustive list. There will be a lot of factions that we uh, we don't cover either because I forgot about them or they're just too too far down on enough of these that they really wouldn't be they're not major uh, contenders. So with that all set up, let's get started. First, I'm going to consider these to be the top tier and note that we're not really aiming for a positive answer as to this is the best faction. We're just going through some tiers and talking about uh, each of the members of the tiers. So the real contenders, in my view, they've built a society that has staying power. They educate their people. Uh, they thrive, at least for a certain notion. And like all societies, they're allowed to have flaws, but their flaws are survivable. And so there's, let's start with the New California Republic. And as we know from their history, after their initial period, they became democratic, uh, meaning they elect their leaders. Um, we're not gonna really go into the difference uh, b between all the definitions floating around governments of that general type, but they have representative leadership. Uh, they have some interesting quirks uh, at least as far as we can tell along those ways, but uh, they're rough, uh, they are democratic. They might be a democratic republic, but they're, they're certainly a, a democracy of some flavor. Uh, in terms of membership, uh, really their citizens can be hired into government service and they have a military, stuff like that. And their cit citizenship seems to be uh, generally open. Anybody willing can become a citizen of the NCR. And their future looks to be a slow expansion of agriculture and Western style democracy of some flavor. And they seem to have a largely independent market economy. In terms of their neighbors, they eventually absorb their willing neighbors. 
and they uh, slowly uh, conquer their unwilling ones. Um, I consider this to be a minus. Um, it sets them up for conflict. But in a way, it's not a big minus because if you don't do this ever, then you're leaving uh, foreign nations embedded in yourself. And uh, that is a security threat. It's an ideological threat. It, uh, it can be bad. Uh, you just have to be really careful with how quickly you do it. Um, if you're very slow and diplomatic and clever about it, then that's a good thing. But the NCR historically is not that. Um, culturally and scientifically, they seem to be a mostly maybe 1900s uh, era technology. In term, uh, they can maintain newer tech and they seem to educate their people. And so I actually think the NCR is probably the most sustainable and optimistic long-term leader of the American wastelands. They're built to last, and barring exceptionally strong neighbors, they'll likely slowly take over and pacify everything in their path. And given that their citizens seem to have rights, despite their corruption, and despite uh, all their problems, because the game does kind of gripe at them, particularly in Fallout New Vegas, I think that they're actually a pretty good option. Um, they, they're a fairly optimistic idea of the way uh, things can be. Next up, we have the Enclave. And I know that uh, the the game seemed to suggest that the Encla Enclave is wiped out. I consider that unlikely given how much land they, uh, they started with, given how many bases they could have all over the place. I suspect that they're actually numerous and powerful maybe not in the areas that the games are set, but they're probably all over the place and they probably actually control a fair amount of territory. Um, their leadership is a uh, puppet democracy, meaning it, uh, it has the, it makes ideological claims to be a democracy, but lacks any substantial pluralism, meaning people running against each other. They vote, but they, but their votes are essentially meaningless. Um, their membership uh, is presumably hired or drafted from their, uh, their citizens, and their citizenship is primarily derived from their internal population, possibly with captured vaults and uh, therefore vault dwellers, but they seem to restrict themselves to non-mutated humans only, or almost exclusively non-mutated humans. Uh, this is probably a weakness. Um, in a way that they're going to have lower medical costs because they don't, uh, I'm imagining that most wastelanders um, actually have fairly substantial uh, medical issues and it's not heavily depicted in the Fallout series, but it's something that I'm assuming. Uh, and the Enclave, by focusing on non-mutated, pure-blooded humans, they're not going to have as many medical issues. And by not having ghouls, not having uh, any of the other creatures of the wasteland, that's going to be a mixed bag for them. The future under them would look like a military takeover and cl cleansing, and I am using that with some sarcastic quotes because it's a pretty nasty term. Essentially an ethnic cleansing of the wasteland in the restoration, uh, well, except it's not really ethnic exactly, but in this future world, if we consider ghouls to be an ethnicity, non-feral ghouls, then yeah, it's kind of an ethnic uh, cleansing. Uh, and they'd have a restoration of the old American government, sort of. Uh, the old American government in the Fallout series is suggested to be fairly corrupt. Uh, much more corrupt than the real world uh, American government. Um, but uh, so that's the future. Their economy is really never discussed. We don't see a lot of enclave-controlled lands in the game. Presumably there are, are those because there's no way they could sustain themselves without that. Uh, their people need to eat somehow. Um, but just we never get a peek into the enclave's uh, economy. Their relationship with their neighbors is bad. They conquer or exterminate pretty much all their neighbors, uh, depending on if they're pure humans, and again, they presumably would often conquer um, 
vaults, although I think in some games they're depicted as exterminating a lot of people from, uh, from vaults, which would be a stupid thing of them to do. Uh, there's no reason for them to do that, and they presumably would, should prefer to have the people as part of their population, but a lot of games kind of buy into that silly idea of evil, and they have people doing self-destructive things for no good reason. But I, I, I would consider them to be much more likely to just prefer to conquer vaults and uh, integrate those people into their, uh, into their empire. Uh, we see that uh, in terms of their cultural and scientific strength, uh, they presumably can maintain and innovate at a very high technical level, presumably at pre-apocalypse uh, levels or something close to it. They must educate their people very well. Um, so they're quite strong at that, probably one of the stronger factions at doing that. So in terms of overall evaluation, the Enclave is probably pretty sustainable barring massive military defeats. Um, their willingness to exterminate large parts of the wasteland before repopulating them makes them a very gloomy future, as does their general militancy. They have managed several facilities and settlements uh, over the centuries, and, and so I, I'm, again, I, uh, I presume they still have plenty, despite some defeats in the series. I imagine the Enclave is still a very strong force uh, there's a good chance that they would be a future, uh, regardless of whether we think they should. And next, we'll cover the essential, uh, essential mirror image of the Enclave, the Brotherhood of Steel. The Brotherhood of Steel's leadership is a hereditary autocracy, meaning that anybody who is um, descended of the Maxim family uh, because Maxim was apparently the military leader. Again, uh, the Brotherhood of Steel and the Enclave are both descended from the U.S. military. Uh, but the Brotherhood of Steel kind of went in the way of uh, going medieval. And so <clears throat> their leadership is semi-it's semi-hereditary at the top levels, and then you have a certain amount of kind of sort of merit-based probably at levels beneath that. Um, it's not a very good system, but it's what they have. And it's probably fairly sustainable. Um, in terms of membership, it's derived from their internal population. Uh, this varies a lot over the series, but uh, it seems to be very rarely offered to outsiders. Uh, except some chapters offer or, or did offer membership to non-pure humans, but most do not. Uh, many of them seem keen on exterminating non-pure humans. In terms of citizenships, they seem to be willing to rule over and extract resources from populations of generally pure humans, as depicted in Fallout 4, but they don't seem to generally govern them very heavily. This is probably a weakness and that they seem military heavy and not actually very engaged in governance. Uh, this will create problems for them long term because they're essentially uh, warlords. Um, kind of a modern idea of what it means to be a warlord, but they're warlords and by not engaging with and controlling the political systems, they could very easily end up being at their mercy in the long term. Their future would look like they'd be happy to rule pacified, largely human civilian populations, extract resources from them, and wage war on foreign organized groups within zones they have a, enough of a presence in. Their economy seems to be a command economy within the organization, and they seem to be less opinionated on economic forms of their populations and areas they control. Um, with regards to their neighbors, they would want to pacify all the foreign forces in the areas they control, uh, possibly kill non-humans, depending on uh, which version of the Brotherhood of Steel we're talking about. They seem to be slow to expand into new areas unless they find a military or tech justification, like they're looking for tech from some pre-war uh, facility, something like that. 
In terms of cultural and scientific strength, they seem to be able to maintain things at a high technical level, but they surprisingly have a limited interest in innovation without a military justification. They're high tech, but tech phobic in that they see technology as being very dangerous. Um, so that's a weird twist because uh, ordinarily kind, kind of expect a faction to be high tech and wanting to be high tech or low tech and wanting to be low tech. They're kind they're, they somehow manage to have an ideology that uh, that's between that. Um, I consider their their command structure to be brittle at the top. Um, they uh, they uh, actually I guess I already covered some of the things in the notes. I, uh, I think the Brotherhood of Steel is a lot like the Enclave but they're less competent because of their lack of civilian, uh, lack of a civilian side. They're sometimes more friendly, sometimes not. Um, and, but they, they would really, they would need to make some changes to function as a government. But if they, if they were to, uh, they could, uh, they could do a pretty good job. Um, although I would not want to live in the society that they would build, uh, both because uh, they're kind of ridiculous. Um, uh, and I know uh, House in Fallout New Vegas describes them as such. I think he's right. Um, but they, they're just, they just don't, uh, they're never depicted as having a, a civil side, um, meaning they don't, they, they don't think about civilian issues. And, uh, yeah, just their, their whole military ranks and stuff. They're, it's just silly. Uh, and they're not future looking. They're horribly xenophobic. Uh, so I think they're a bad option, but they potentially would be pretty effective. And on that note, let's talk about uh, uh, Caesar's Legion or Kaiser's Legion. Their leadership is a direct singular autocracy. Uh, there's Kaiser. He leads uh, the Kaiser's Legion, and uh, everything below tends to flow from his will one way or another. And it's unclear what would happen uh, when Kaiser dies. In terms of membership, their uh, membership uh, comes from their internal population, or it's drafted from conquered or subject peoples. We see a lot of this happening in Fallout New Vegas, where they are uh, most active. In terms of citizenship, they seem to have a very large population of subject peoples at varying levels of autonomy. Uh, it, it's not super well explained uh, which populations would uh, just be fully integrated into the military uh, part of Kaiser's Legion and which would become subject peoples. It might be how much a population fights against them or how militaristic it is but we know that they have a large non-member uh, civilian population. Uh, the future under them would look like them pacifying all foreign forces in areas they control. Uh, they prioritize rapid expansion and um, they do cultural integration with all the tribes they come across. Their economy is largely a market system. They mint coins and uh, their economy is, uh, it has command elements to fund their military as needed. In terms of their neighbors, they're hostile to all organized neighbors. Um, there are a few pacifist organizations that they can get along with, but they have to uh, pretty much be, uh, have no ambitions of their own. In terms of their cultural and scientific strength, they seem to be uninterested in tech, uh, technological or cultural innovation. Uh, they prefer stability along those lines. So Kaiser's Legion is interesting. They've never had a leadership transition, at least at the top level. And their ideologies about who Kaiser is might make this very rough unless the new leader takes on the name and role of Kaiser. Uh, moderate demoralization could easily break their ideologies hold over their empire and uh, fracture it. And so any defeat, military or economic, would probably be very uh, more costly for them than for others. 
Um, and I, I'm not considering Kaisar's expressed intent to merge his empire with the conquered NCR cause, because that would transform it too much. But Kaisar's Legion has a lot of potential. I, I, I really wouldn't want to live in it. Um, although they are described as being very good at uh, security. But I think that they would be highly effective. They do a lot of the right things you need to do to control territory uh, to, and to be an effective nation. Um, but really the, the leadership issue is the toughest issue for them. And finally, in this category, uh, we'll talk about the Institute. Um, so the leadership there is a transferable, I guess I would consider it to be a transferable technocratic autocracy with merit-based lower levels. Uh, meaning we've seen the director of the Institute hand off leadership to whomever uh, the director chooses. Uh, a, um, it looks like all the other lower levels, uh, people reach uh, uh, leadership roles through scientific achievement. Their membership seems to mostly come from their internal population with very selective recruitment of outsiders. Their citizenship is not meaningfully distinguished from their membership. Uh, they seem generally uninterested in ruling outsiders or in having a distinct civilian population. Uh, so this is probably a minus for them, but uh, they're just not trying to do that. And it's important to note that they also have a slave caste of intelligent near humans and an extensive uh, set of robot servants. Uh, more about that later. Uh, those presumably w should not be considered citizens, although th I guess they're denizens. Their economy seems to be a collective, uh, collectivist organization style economy. Uh, as far as we can tell, they don't do much in the way of trading. Uh, they're run kind of like a university would be run internally. Um, in terms of neighbors, they seem to be range from hostile to uncaring of other forces, depending on how much threat they pose. Uh, they seem to be, I think, hostile to ghouls. But generally, the, uh, their, their take is they're going to just be defensive. Uh, they, don't, they don't really want to conquer land. They don't really want to, want to interact with neighbors. And because of the way that they've lived, uh, they primarily exist underground, uh, out of sight and out of reach of uh, other factions. Um, they have intelligence services uh, like any state would. Uh, and they do shady things in those like any state would. But by and large, they, they prefer to be invisible and untouchable. And uh, so that doesn't expose them to a lot of risk. In terms of their cultural and scientific strength, they, they have an unrivaled research focus. It's almost uh, the main, it's almost the only thing that they're interested in. And so we know that they've existed from the times of the Great War as a society of scientists and supporters. They've continually educated each new generation with their creed as they slowly dig down into the earth and cut off access above them. Uh, they have a demonstrated and public lack of ethics, uh, at least as a whole, and that makes for some serious downsides, although we see some internal dissent on some ethical topics. And so in the long run, they have a pretty good chance, I think, of remaining independent and eventually leaving the planet. Uh, although with their ending in Fallout 4, they take an enhanced presence in their area and become at least a little bit visible. I'm assuming that they've spread to other isolated locations to have some redundancy in case uh, their main location is destroyed. Uh, it's not depicted, but it's... Uh, it's hard to believe that they wouldn't do that. So I think even in the endings where their main uh, location is defeated uh, and destroyed, uh, I imagine they're still there. They probably have other underground facilities and they're probably doing fine. Uh, if the Fallout 4 protagonist were to use their potential leadership of the Institute correctly, 
they uh, one could fix the ethical issues and fix a lot of their flaws um, because I think their society needs some strong moral and ethical checks. Uh, they're responsible for the existence of uh, a large super mutant population in uh, the uh, the Boston area, and that was self de uh, destructive in the long run. Uh, a, a lot of their other efforts are uh, just self-destructive to their interests. Uh, and I think the Fallout 4 protagonist could also, bit by bit, shift the views and eventually policy on synths and evolve them towards uh, citizenship. We know that there are some people in the Institute that already see uh, synths that way. Um, but uh, but what the protagonist would choose to do were they to leave the Institute, it's uncertain. Um, a reformed Institute, uh, really primarily reforming the synthesis slaves uh, side of things, uh, getting rid of that aspect of their society and treating synths uh, with, uh, with human rights. Uh, I think that would go most of the way, if not all of the way, towards making the Institute the most ide idealistic notion of, uh, notion of the future, even potentially more desirable than the NCR. But without those reforms, uh, there are some serious ethical issues with the Institute that make them a bit of a, a more gloomy future. Um, as an academe, I like the idea of academes running things, but you need to have ethics involved. Uh, maybe not uh, so substantial that everybody has to agree with the ethics, uh, but the Institute has, it's depicted as having practically no moral safeguards. Uh, and that's just not a place where we should want them to exist or where we would want ourselves to live. Next up, let's go into the maybes. I would say that these have some potential to be a nation but they have uh, some of the flaws mentioned. Uh, they have flaws in the areas where we laid out for evaluation that could easily sink their efforts. First off, we have the three families of New Vegas. Their leadership, uh, their leaders seem to be either appointed by, uh, by house or they were existing leaders of tribes that were pacified by house. Uh, their membership presumably either comes from their internal population or uh, just general residents of New Vegas. Um, I would imagine both. Their citizenship is not a well-developed concept because citizenship seems to generally just mean a denizen of the uh, New Vegas area. But if they ever gained power and effectively started to look like a government, they would probably have to develop their idea of citizenship. But by and large, uh, as depicted, they are essentially second bananas under, uh, under house in terms of ruling uh, New Vegas. Their economy seems to be market outside of industries directly controlled by the families. They presumably have a lot of leverage towards family control of profitable industries. Uh, their relations with their neighbors are primarily directed by house. And they seem to be generally friendly to other factions uh, as houses because house uh, prefers economic dominance over other kinds. In terms of their cultural and scientific strength, they seem to have no particular direct interest in innovation. And we have to note that they're not directly in power, but they're the most li likely successors to house when he dies of either old age or mishap. It's unclear uh, what the power balance between them would look like and whether it would be stable. Um, they, they have untested succession mechanisms, I think. Um, and it's also unclear from the game lore whether House has been continually shaping their culture or whether it was a one-time thing. Um, but uh, they, they have the potential to lead uh, and we know that House is not gonna live forever. Next up, we have the Boomers, also from New Vegas. Uh, their leadership seems to be a fairly loose leadership with unknown specifics. Uh, presumably depends a lot on cultural momentum. Their membership seems to be 
uh, they're one of those factions where the membership and citizenship are not meaningfully distinguished. Seems to be mostly hereditary, but they're theoretically open to new members uh, if those new members can survive reaching their uh, base. Uh, they sometimes seem to invite uh, a few promising new members, but generally it's primarily their internal population. Their economy seems to be a disorganized tribal economy. They don't really trade with their neighbors. Uh, internal trade is not well depicted. And their relationship with their neighbors is generally strongly isolationist. They don't want to uh, have close ties to their neighbors and they would prefer to be self-sufficient. In terms of cultural and scientific strength, they seem to be interested in innovation and they're depicted as educating their children, uh, which is not always the case. Uh, so they are self-sustaining pretty well. They're former vaulters. They, uh, they had the experience of running a society inside of a vault and they kept their society going since the time of the Great War. Um, so they're both preserved and stifled by their isolationism, which limits their numbers and their reach. Uh, they're not going to grow very quickly if they keep that, but they'll probably be around for a long time. And uh, if they somehow were to either naturally grow enough or if they were to find a way to engage with their environment without getting wiped out, they do pretty well. Next up, Diamond City. Uh, their leadership is an elected but puppet mayor, puppet of the Institute. Uh, they have a civilian government. In terms of membership, again, their membership and citizenship are not very well distinguished, but their leadership is presumably either elected or hired, um, presumably mostly from their internal population. Their citizenship is, again, from their internal population, but they're also presumably open to uh, peaceful humans moving in. Uh, they are, in modern times, not depicted as open to others such as non-feral ghouls. Uh, they're a humans-only club. Uh, their economy is a market one, and you see a lot of market interactions. Uh, their economic power is actually uh, pretty strong. In terms of neighbors, they're generally friendly with other settlements and neighbors. They like trading with them, trade with a lot of farmers in the area. Um, their cultural and scientific strength is strong. They have educational facilities. They seem to do little visible dedicated research, um, but it might still be present. They don't appear to be expansionist. They have not really civilized areas outside of their walls. Um, it'd be interesting if they were to start to do so, but they seem to be a viable society with a defined area and plenty of room to grow in it and plenty of room to grow uh, outside of it. They do self-defense well, they do trade very well. Um, and although their leadership is invisibly a puppet of the Institute, this wasn't always the case. And it could be disrupted with probably little disruption of government continuity. Um, they do have a light security presence outside the stadium, but again, no visible settlement. Uh, so they would have to change to expand, but it's not hard to imagine them doing so. Uh, they have all the stuff they need. Uh, they have all the answers really figured out. Uh, to, to be a viable society. Next up, uh, the, the Pit Raiders. Their leadership, so they're a, a raider gang led by a singular former Brotherhood of Steel um, uh, guy. Their lower levels of leadership follow raider semantics, uh, meaning if you're strong and fight, you can climb the ladder. Uh, but their actual leadership seems to be just him. Their membership is uh, presumably recruited from their internal slave population that passes a dangerous test that usually kills people who try it. Their citizenship is not exactly citizenship, but they're slaves that were captured and protected by their raider class. Their economy is a command economy with both raiding and internal production. Uh, they have, uh, they've managed to get a lot of the forges from pre-war Pittsburgh active again, and they're using them to build stuff. In terms of uh, foreign policy, uh, they have a capture or kill mentality for their uh, neighbors. Uh, 
because uh, they're essentially raiders uh, with more organization than uh, raiders generally do. Uh, and uh, in terms of cultural and scientific strength, they have a research focus. Uh, they're hoping to bootstrap a modern economy by continuing to uh, reindustrialize uh, Pittsburgh. And they also have uh, medical research going on to cure the uh, plague that's impacting their people. So they have a civilizing mission, but below their leader, uh, who I think his name is Lord Ashur or something like that, uh, it's it's all raiders. When he dies, uh, likely they'll uh, they'll either fall apart or just become a large uh, stationary raider gang. Although the incentives are there enough to continue their industrial mission, it's just unclear whether they could successfully do that without. Uh, a leader with serious leadership ability and technical know-how, which they have with uh, Ashur. Um, otherwise, it'll just die. So they'll, they'll have to develop culturally uh, and possibly outgrow their raider phase or, or their civilization is limited to the lifetime of Lord Ashur. They have a decent shot at it. It just, uh, but really the transition from uh, from a slave-based economy uh, to a citizenship-based one. It's rough. Historically, it's happened a lot. Like a lot of the time, barbarians turned into city leaders. Uh, but uh, it it needs to happen. Whether it happens before he dies, uh, possibly of old age or accident, uh, will decide the future of the Pit Raiders. Next up, the Nuka World Operators. Um, their leadership is a family dictatorship with a business-like hierarchy below. Uh, presumably, the family di uh, dictatorship part could disappear. Uh, business-like hierarchies are well-studied and can be stable, can be effective. I don't think the family dictatorship si uh, side would really be that much of a negative. Um, uh, their membership, it, they're presumably joinable by capable conquered citizens or possibly from an internal population of members, possibly others. In terms of citizenship, they will happily conquer and rule settlements. Their economy is a mix of mar uh, market, uh, a market economy, raiding, and, uh, and crime uh, that takes place in more civilized areas. In terms of neighbors, they'll coexist with other gangs, possibly other groups. I think they're actually doing reasonably well on this, although presumably they'd fight anyone who would object to their way of living, which is pretty objectionable, so it's not hard to imagine. Um, in terms of cultural and scientific strength, they're not hostile to research, but they're not that interested in it. So of all the nu Nuka World Raider factions, they're the most likely to civilize and become a real force long term. Uh, despite their unclear leadership transition practices, uh, a transition to actual power would have to de-emphasize the criminal nature of their org uh, as they would need to establish and enforce laws. But again, of the raider factions, they're the most likely to turn into a uh, functional society. Next up, Rivet City. Their leadership is a council that's elected from three constituent groups. Uh, it's democratic in form. Their membership has a complex relationship to citizens. Uh, their citizens are descended from scientists, civilians, and security personnel. And those are their three uh, classes of society. And they're derived from pre-war orgs. Uh, they have a market economy. They do a lot of trading in, in the DC area. Uh, they're friendly to friendly powers. Uh, they're currently restricted to the innards of their broken aircraft carrier. But it's um, easy to imagine their expansion outwards, and it would probably resemble the early days of the NCR. Uh, we know that they have schools. We know that they uh, conduct pretty ambitious research. They have a good uh, cultural and scientific strength. Um, so they'd probably become an easy place to live, but they're not likely to want to expand very rapidly. Next up, the Gunners. They have unknown leadership. Uh, but they seem to be a military-style organization. Uh, if, they have uh, if they have citizens, they're never depicted. Um, they probably don't. 
they don't seem to run an economy, but they make themselves available for hire in various parts of the wasteland. Uh, in terms of neighbors, they're friendly to some, hostile to others. In terms of cultural and scientific strength, it's largely unknown, but we know that they can at least acquire and use a lot of pre-war technology of the U.S. military. Uh, we know that uh, they can handle advanced weapons, robots, vertebrates. They're very organized and they're trained to communicate over long distances. Uh, they think about the welfare of their members. They uh, are really pretty well organized. So they're underexplained under and underexplored in the Fallout games. Uh, they're really only present clearly in Fallout 4, but they're able to project force outside the Boston area. Um, they've sent expeditions out into the Nuka World area. They would need to significantly change themselves to actually create and run a government of some kind. But if they decide to do so, they could protect their assets well and presumably become an effective nation. So I think they, they have a lot of potential, uh, but they haven't yet transformed themselves into the right way or uh, into haven't yet transformed themselves in productive ways to actually become a nation. Next up, we have a few limited lifetime empires. Uh, these are empires that are currently too tied to their founders to likely be a nation longer term. They lack tested succession mechanisms, and it's actually a little bit hard to imagine a successful succession. So likely either an accident or old age uh, would end them. And I put two things in this category, but there's actually uh, quite a lot more that we don't cover. First, New Vegas under Robert House. Leadership is a direct singular autocracy with robotic enforcement. This is a huge weakness because uh, House is not going to live forever. Um, eventually his health will fail. His, uh, he's already in a really pretty bad state by the time New Vegas happens. Um, he's stuck motionless inside a tube. Uh, and so eventually disease will end him, old age will end him, something will end him. In terms of membership, uh, apart from very rare direct agents, uh, all the members, as I would define it, are robotic and programmed by house. In terms of citizenship, uh, New Vegas is essentially controlled by uh, Robert House, and he's generally open to anybody uh, that he thinks will fit in, that he can make a profit out of. He's a little bit choosy, but he allows a lot of people into uh, New Vegas. Um, in terms of the future, uh, he would like to hold off foreign powers from a takeover, coexist with them, maintain technological superiority and achieve economic control uh, and essentially co-opt all the other nations nearby. In terms of economy, it's a market economy outside of industries directly controlled by house. Uh, in terms of neighbors, he would like to manipulate his neighbors to maintain a power balance apart from a few that he would just like to wipe out. In terms of cultural and scientific strength, he is interested and continued technological innovation. But a lot of uh, what happens in practice is bandwidth limited because it's done by House himself. And there seems to be little direct faction advancement that he doesn't do, which again is not gonna be that great when whenever he uh, finally dies. So I suspect that uh, his style of uh, administration will fall when House finally dies of old age or disease uh, he never seems to have set up a mechanism for transfer of power, and the absolute centralization of power will really bite uh, bite him. I mean, it'll really bite what he built. But even failing that, there's, uh, there's harm that comes from the level of centralization. A single person, no matter how brilliant they are, no matter how long their heads start, they can't match the continued innovation and development of entire civilizations. Nobody is that smart. Uh, so... Uh, new Vegas is eventually going to fall under new leadership that will not much resemble House's leadership. The other faction that clearly fits in this is the Think Tank. And their leadership is essentially a loose relationship of six ancient scientists in robot bodies. In terms of membership, it's just those six, uh, six scientists so far. In terms of citizenship, uh, it's just robots of various kinds, non-sentient, non-sentient, 
and a few other creatures they have under their commands. They have no known civilian population. Uh, they don't seem to have an economy. They are probably hostile to their neighbors all, uh, to the extent that they're interested in them. Uh, in terms of cultural and scientific strength, they actually have a high technical level and a high ability to innovate. Uh, again, limited by numbers. And so they're deeply limited by their small number of intelligent leaders and lack of a population. Unless those things change, they have a very limited future because their members will eventually die. Uh, age, accident, something will happen uh, and that'll be it for the think tank. Uh, here we're just going to cover a few. Uh, few civilizations are just don't seem to be ambitious enough to rule more than their current area. Um, or they're currently under the shadow of other powers and not really interested in stepping out. But there's a lot of other civilizations that we'll uh, omit from discussion. So there's New Vegas under the kings. Their leadership is a loose autocracy. Their membership presumably comes from either their internal population or general New Vegas residents. In terms of citizenship, those are just the residents of New Vegas, uh, probably mostly Freeside, which is the part of New Vegas where, uh, where they have power. Their economy seems to be market, and they're currently kept from having a strong influence by House's presence and their unwillingness to cooperate with House. Um, in terms of their neighbors, they're not powerful enough to ex ex exert a strong influence on, their, uh, on them. They're largely friendly to foreign powers unless they're too powerful. Um, in terms of cultural and scientific strength, they seem to have no particular interest in innovation. They're focused on a cult of personality, uh, amusingly uh, not in the normal sense of the word. Uh, <coughs> So their untested succession mechanisms uh, might not be that much of a minus because they're all Elvis impersonators. And so leadership would presumably just pass to another Elvis impersonator. The current uh, leader is unusually intelligent and uh, savvy, uh, but presumably they'd eventually have other savvy leaders. Um, but they probably wouldn't survive serious conflict with other groups unless they really grew and giving up the elvish shtick would probably help a lot. Next we have Jacobstown. And Jacobstown seems to be a direct loose autocracy by its founder. Their membership appear to be the super mutants and nightkin that are uh, publicly aligned with Marcus. Uh, and their citizenship uh, seems to be just generally the super mutants and nightkin living in their area. Uh, with some human guests and some uh, ghoul guests. Uh, it's worth noting that super mutants and nightkin are not generally able to reproduce and new ones of them don't come along very easily. So in the long term, that's a problem. Their economy seems to be based primarily on foraging and a certain amount of collectivism. It's not super well depicted. They would like to be peaceful with their neighbors uh, but they have some aggressive neighbors, so they primarily take a defensive posture on the lands that they control. In terms of cultural and scientific strength, they probably have no real potential for innovation. Um, super mutants and nightkin generally don't seem to be all that scientifically interested, uh, nor really all that interested in large-scale civilization. Um, they have little potential to rule non-mutants, probably little interest. Uh, they depend very heavily on Marcus's uh, leadership and they likely would fall apart without him, although he, uh, because he's a, um, because he's a super mutant, he would probably live a, uh, in a first generation one at that, he'll probably live a long time barring accident, but they are very, very unlikely to expand beyond their area and we can just imagine them slowly dwindling uh, as the decades and centuries roll by because they're functionally immortal unless killed, but they don't reproduce. Next up, the Dead Horses and the Sorrows. These are two tribes living in, um, uh, in I think, was it Bryce Canyon? Uh, in uh, New Vegas in one of the DLCs. 
Their leadership seems to be generally a democracy with some outside advisors. Uh, their membership seems to be largely the same as their citizenship, and both of them come from an internal population. Their economy seems to be tribal collectivism, hunter-based. Their, uh, their relationship with their neighbors is they tend to be reclusive. Uh, in terms of their cultural and scientific strength, they're both pretty wary of research. Uh, they have some taboos about it. They seem to be not particularly keen on expansion. They seem to provide a reasonable quality of life, uh, but they're not likely to really want to expand much uh, bigger. And uh, it would be hard for them to have the population growth to naturally grow outwards. Next up, the White Legs, another tribe from that area. Leadership seem to be tribal warlords. Their membership, like their citizenship, is from their internal population. Their economy is tribal collectivism, scavenging and raiding based. They raid, unlike the Dead Horses or the Sorrows. And they're warlike to their neighbors, but they're not particularly expansionistic. In terms of cultural and scientific strength, they're deeply superstitious. And based on tab uh, taboos, so they're unlikely to start research anytime soon. So most likely, they'll be swept aside by some rising regional power. Um, although the terrain makes wiping them out difficult. So barring any major change, they have no real chance of becoming a real civilization. <clears throat> Next up, the Town of Covenant and the compound tied to it. <coughs> Their leadership is an elected mayor. They have an un unelected compound leader. It's unclear how somebody gets that role. Their membership, they have a civilian government elected from their internal population, but the compound presumably is open to anyone who shares their creed. Their citizenship seems to be open to refugees and others who share their creed. In terms of their economy, their town has a poorly run market economy and the compound has an organization type. <coughs> <coughs> organization type economy, meaning uh, direct co control and use of resources. They don't run their market economy particularly well. In terms of neighbors, they're hostile to synths and possibly other non-humans. Otherwise, they're trade friendly. They're not really expansionist. It's not part of their goal. And in terms of culture and scientific strength, we know the compound does research on a few topics. So they are scientific somewhat in nature, but it's very limited. <coughs> so if we were to treat the game depiction of both parts as representing much larger groups, we could imagine the orgs merging into a single unit in the future, and that would provide a reasonable foundation for society, but they likely wouldn't be very expansionistic. Next up, Acadia. Uh, this is a synth settlement up in uh, Bar Harbor. Their leadership is a loose charisma driven autocracy. That is Dima is a uh, prototype synth and he runs things. Their membership makes little distinction between members and citizens. Their citizens are just rescued evacuated synths from the Commonwealth. <coughs> <coughs> Their economy seems to have both trade and internal production. It's not very large scale. Uh, a lot of it seems to be a command economy. <clears throat> In terms of neighbors, they use subterfuge to maintain peaceful relations with local powers. They're not that expansionistic. Uh, they have a um, <clears throat> kind of subversive side to their foreign policy. We're not going to go far into that. Uh, they're presumably interested in and very capable of research, but that's not heavily depicted. They likely wouldn't want to grow beyond what's needed to care for the refugees, and they have no natural population growth, but they're very cap uh, capable of self-defense. <coughs> <coughs> yeah, excuse me, I, I I'm, uh, haven't talked this long for a while. Next up, Far Harbor Harborman. <coughs> 
uh, leadership. They have elected mayors, which is currently a puppet leader from Acadia. Uh, their membership is hired or elected citizens. Their citizenship seems to be mostly from an internal population. They are presumably open to peaceful human newcomers from the outside in small numbers. <clears throat> their economy is trade-based, although they have good internal production. In terms of neighbors, they're distrustful, but, uh, but not hostile to non-hostile neighbors. Unfortunately, their neighbors are uh, um, a mixed bag on that front. They're not particularly expansionist, and they're constrained by natural hazards uh, from seriously expanding, although some of their members seem to have the run of the island if they're particularly tough. <clears throat> in terms of cultural and scientific strength, they're not depicted as interested in scientific research. They have no visible educational system. So they're likely stuck in cultural stasis for now, uh, and unless the fog were to pull back from their area they probably couldn't expand it's unclear whether they'd be able to handle larger scales next up good neighbor uh, they have elected mayors currently a ghoul named hancock mcdonough um they're uh so they seem to have an established way to transfer power it's unclear whether it's very functional because he ended up killing his uh, predecessor. Membership is presumably hired by Hancock, uh, Hancock. The citizenship comes from an internal population, but they seem to have an open immigration policy. So probably actually one of the more open uh, for a group, um, uh, open immigration policies. Her economy is based on trade, a little bit of internal production. <clears throat> In terms of neighbors, they're generally friendly to neighbors that don't make trouble. In terms of cultural and scientific strength, they're not centralized enough for education or scientific research. <coughs> so I think they're likely stuck in cultural stasis. They might not survive a change in leadership. But they have a pretty decent population base, so I wouldn't write them out, but they're unlikely to really expand. <clears throat> We're also in a very dangerous area of the city. And next up, the Republic of Dave. The leadership is a semi-hereditary autocracy. Uh, membership seems to be, apart from the leader, everybody's a citizen. Citizen seems to be from an internal population uh, and possibly anybody else that the current autocrat accepts. They have an internal command economy, some external trade. They're pretty isolationist, although they're presumably not very hostile to outsiders. In terms of cultural and scientific strength, they actually have a school, but it's unclear if they could do real research if they had enough of a population base. They're currently very small, even though you might assume that they're bigger uh, and that any civilian seen in the Fallout games represents many civilians in the, the, the world. Their transitions of power seem peaceful but messy. And it's unclear what it could be like if it were to grow, but it probably wouldn't scale super well. <clears throat> and next up, a fairly long list of excessively flawed candidates they have some ideological or other deep flaw that would prevent them from becoming a functional nation. Uh, a lot of other excessively flawed orgs were omitted. These are the more interesting ones. <clears throat> and sometimes I just included factions because I want to talk about why they're flawed and wouldn't work. First off, followers of the apocalypse. They have an unknown leadership structure, possibly democratic, possibly informed by NCR structures. Membership is open to those that take up their creed. Citizenship is also presumably open to those that take up their creed. <coughs> their economy is presumably a market one. Um, 
although it also is partly an, a, an organization style one because they're almost more of an organization and society like secret society or something like that rather than a real uh, nation. Although sometimes they act like a nation. <clears throat> in terms of neighbors, they're willing to coexist peacefully and openly in the shadows of other factions. They'll occasionally take up arms to deal with threats, not very often. In terms of their cultural and scientific strength, they seem moderately interested in innovation at a controlled pace. Uh, so they're a lot like the early NCR, but they're soft to the point of being unworkable. They're not wed to pacifism, but they are wed to volunteerism, and that just makes their viability unworkable. And they don't have much in the way of standalone settlements and structures. <clears throat> but if they're, un if they're not able to control territory and resources, then they're not going to really function as a civilization. <clears throat> Next up, the Great Khans. Leadership is a transferable autocracy. Membership is mostly hereditary, but open to new members. Same thing with their citizenship. Their economy is essentially a raider one, uh, mixed with some selling of drugs. Otherwise, they're presumably collectivist internally. In terms of neighbors, they balance between raiding and trading. <clears throat> In terms of cultural and scientific strength, they seem to be open to mild innovation, but they're not deeply into tech and they're not organized enough to change that. <coughs> so they're essentially tribal. They'll likely be wiped out by any rising power that would want to pacify the area uh, because they make trouble. They're going to have some, uh, it might have some future if they merge with the followers. Uh, which does happen in one ending to Fallout New Vegas, as their defects and strengths can could blend into a viable future society. They do have some standalone settlements as well, so they're not. They have some potential, but uh, as depicted, they would need to change a lot. Next up, Children of Adam. They're a decentralized cult spread all over the continent, have varying leadership practices, generally transferable. Uh, it's kind of a, a decentralized theocracy in a way. <clears throat> Membership and citizenship are the same thing. Seems to be open to people who accept their creed. Their economy seems to be collectivist. Um, in terms of neighbors, most chapters seem to be open to peaceful coexistence. Uh, they don't take criticism, uh, criticism of their creed at all well. Uh, some chapters are very militant and kill on sight. In terms of culture and scientific strength, they are apparently interested in innovation on certain topics. Uh, they are limited by the health impacts of their creed, by their craziness. Uh, they don't seem super interested in ruling outsiders, and they easily draw the hostility of others. But at the same time, they have managed several self-sustaining settlements, which is more that can be said, uh, can be said for many in this section. <coughs> Next up, Habologists. Leadership seems to be family and religious leaders. Uh, citizenship and membership aren't distinguished. They're open to those that share their creed. The economy seems to be collectivist slash organization. Uh, in terms of neighbors, it seems like most of their chapters would be open to peaceful coexistence. In terms of cultural and scientific strength, they do seem to be interested in innovation on certain topics and are surprisingly good for being crazy. They are limited by their crazy. They easily draw the hostility of others. And their only known standalone settlement is very small. Next up, the Minutemen. Their leadership is uh, fairly decentralized, loose squad type leadership. Uh, they have a um, sometimes have a general that doesn't do a lot. <clears throat> their membership is open to outsiders that share their creed. In terms of citizenship, they'll guard civilian populations in exchange for fees, uh, 
in volunteers, but this is not enforced. Their economy is organization. In terms of neighbors, they're friendly to non-hostile powers. Um, they have un an unclear cultural and scientific strength. The problem with the Minutemen is that they don't do what it takes to build a strong enough organization to act as a nation. They're not really interested in ruling. They're not really cohesive enough to survive growth of, of societies around them. So they would potentially be absorbed into somebody else as, as a military force. And their only known standalone settlement is a military fort. Um, so they're a little bit like the Brotherhood of Steel, but worse. Um, so yeah, they're just not functional. Next up, the railroad. Leadership is decentralized, loose squad leadership. Membership seems to be that after they vet people, they can join the conspiracy from the edges and move inward as far as they want to and can. Um, they have no civilian population. Their economy is organization. In terms of neighbors, they're hostile to the Institute and to raiders and have a long running conflict with both. In terms of cultural and scientific strength, they have some interest in research. <coughs> and their problem is if the Institute is destroyed, they'll lose their purpose and fall apart. If the Institute is not destroyed, then it will probably destroy them. And uh, and they've been wiped out most entirely several times in their history. So they just don't really have a future, um, almost no matter what. So I, I don't think they could rule, don't think they want to rule, and uh, too many events would knock them over. <clears throat> two, uh, two left to go. Next up. The Nuka World Pack. Leadership is a centralized warlord, replaceable by a successful uh, challenger. Membership is they're presumably joinable by capable conquer citizens or an intern. Uh, otherwise, uh, membership comes from the internal population of members. In terms of citizens, uh, they will conquer and rule settlements, uh, maybe purely for resource extraction. Their economy is based on raiding. In terms of neighbors, they have an une uneasy coexistence with other, other Nuka World gangs. Otherwise, they would try and conquer most other forces they find. <clears throat> In terms of cultural and scientific strength, there's little likelihood of non-basic research because of their culture. So they have a good way to replace their leaders. Point up for them. But civilizing their culture uh, is difficult significantly because of that leadership replacement mechanism. Conquered settlements are not really treated in a way suitable to really benefit from them. Pack members themselves are not directly productive. So they're likely to be wiped out by any sufficiently organized force that would pacify uh, a region uh, that they would uh, exist in. <clears throat> So, not good. And finally, the Nuka World Disciples. Autocratic leadership. Uh, membership, they're presumably joinable by capable conquered citizens, otherwise uh, from their internal population. Uh, in terms of citizenship, they'll conquer and rule settlements very cruelly. Their economy is market or raiding. Uh, in terms of neighbors, they have an uneasy coexistence with other Nuka World gangs, uh, but would fight with probably almost anybody else. Uh, in terms of cultural and scientific strength, they're presumably only interested in limited research on weapons and biology topics. So in a way, they're one of the worst factions. They have an unclear leadership transition. Uh, the group's existence depends on a large reserve of mentally damaged people looking for hedonistic outlets. And they're not a viable society, probably the, uh, the least viable of anybody we talked about. So that's everybody, uh, at least everybody that I chose to put the um, spotlight on. Uh, 
we did cover, I think, the most likely and to a certain degree the best up at the top. Uh, stability is really important in running a government. Uh, a lot of these other factors are really important. And uh, without those, you don't really have a functional government. And uh, if you have any thoughts, leave comments. Uh, I might reply. If you have any ideas for other videos you'd like to see me do, let me know. And bye-bye. Uh,